disease, disasters, wildfires, floods, hurricanes, hatred, division, polarization, mass murders. It's always just so consistently bad, you get used to it, to where you don't even expect anything good to happen. That's why we didn't have offering baskets out, because they're not going to give anything anyway. Why, why bother to set out the offering baskets? So let them leave something by the door. No, really, it's so bad, isn't it, that, that kind of only the dark side of you is even interested in the news. That's how I feel a lot. And it's such that on those rare occasions when you get good news, you almost don't know what to make of it. You almost don't know really what to think when you get good news. But in October, we got good news. In late summer, we got bad news that my wife had breast cancer. She had the annual mammogram, and they flagged something. They had the follow-up mammogram. They saw a clear mass. They had the needle biopsy, and sure enough, it was cancer. Now, the good news was there that it was small. It was early because she had had a mammogram the year before, so there was some reason for hope. But they kind of braced us and prepared us for what might happen, and, and we, we've seen that. We know what might happen. We've seen many women fight brave and courageous and winning battles against breast cancer. And we've seen some women fight brave, courageous battles and, and lose the mortal side of that battle. And even though the surgeon says it's cancer with a little C, uh, you, you hear it as a big C. Yeah. Even though they try to tell you it's a little C, don't panic, there's that, that sense of alarm. So we, we knew what was at stake and what could possibly happen. She had surgery on uh, the 17th of October and my son and daughter and I were sitting in a little makeshift uh, waiting room outside the elevators at Maine Methodist Hospital because of all the construction. There's no really real waiting room, so we're just out there. And there's two parts to the surgery, the cancer part and then the, the reconstruction part. So the cancer part takes about an hour and a half. And after an hour and a half, the cancer surgeon came out and he had a smile on his face. So I, that was encouraging. And he said, we got it, it's gone. And we found a node, we biopsied the sentinel lymph node, and it's clear, no sign of cancer. It's not what you, you, what? You're telling me good news. You're telling me good news when we were braced for the worse. And he goes on to say, we have to do some more uh, lab tests, and we'll be a couple more weeks confirming everything. We, We've got several samples, but I'm very confident that there's no more cancer. It's out of her body. Every now and then, you get good news. On that day, we got great news. She was going to be cancer-free, and sure enough, it was confirmed, and there's no chemotherapy. There's this little white pill we have to take, or she has to take every day for the next five years that reduces an already low risk of recurrence even lower. And that's all great. That's good to hear. You're going to have to move the slide for me. Or Lupina, come up here. <laughs> Show me how this thing works. I'm, I'm so <laughs> technologically old school. Oh, the pros can't do it. There it was. There it is. In Bethlehem, the news was good. Into a world of bad news, into a world of darkness, this event occurred. And a child was born. And that night, in the fields, angels were watching their sheep, I mean, shepherds were watching their sheep. And an angel, and ultimately a host of angels, appeared and said, we have good news. There's, unto you has been born a child. That's great joy. Great joy. Not happiness, not elation, but joy, that thing that goes down very deep in, into a person that embraces tragedy and goodness, darkness and light, that, that, that gets down in you and says, something incredible has happened. And nothing can overcome it or defeat it. Great joy for all people. Everybody 
gets in on this. Do you realize Jesus was not made in America? <laughs> Wrap your mind around that. Do you realize Jesus wasn't made for Americans? We're included, but so is everybody else. He wasn't Anglo. He wasn't African American. He was not Hispanic. He wasn't Asian. He was Middle Eastern. He was born into a family that many of us would be uncomfortable having come into our country today. Think about that. Clear around the world, a child was born for all people in the entire whole wide world. A person. A religion was not born that night. A book did not drop out of the sky. A new political system was not devised and introduced. Nor was an institution born that night. So we're not saved by knowledge. We're not saved by politics. We're not saved by rules and behavior regulations as religion gives it to us. We're not saved by institutions. We're not saved by the one true church that many churches claim to be. We're saved by relationship with a person. It's so incredibly simple, and it's so incredibly good. It is good news for all people. That's every one of us here. That's me and you and everybody here and everybody we know and everybody we don't know. He came for the whole wide world, for all people. And what he offered was not religion, not institution, not knowledge, but himself, a relationship with himself, so that we're called to believe in him, in this child, in this person, and have relationship. And out of that relationship, know this thing called life. Bad news and good news. They go hand in hand, don't they? We know... In fact, when we heard that Sally was going to be okay, you have the little, I guess what they call survivor's guilt or this, this sense of, you know, we know a lot of people that don't hear that. They hear words like metastasized. They hear words like radiation and chemotherapy and prognosis that's iffy. We know many of those ladies, as I said. And you have this instant... I don't say guilt, but compassion and sympathy for those who don't get good news. I don't want to feel like I should be guilty for getting good news. I celebrate the good news, but I recognize at the same time that many people don't because the world still is not a great place to be in much of the time, and we live in a world of bad news. So we have to understand that the way the gospel works is that it doesn't come to remove the bad news. It doesn't come to eliminate it. It doesn't come to solve all our problems. It comes to overcome the bleakness of the world that we live in. If you think about it, in the Bible, these things interact with each other all the time. There's darkness and light. And their story says, light came into the darkness. And the darkness has tried to push it back, but it can't. So darkness and light are in this interplay where they're slapping up against each other. This season of Christmas, our bishop talked about that this month. Did you read his article about how, how light and dark are bouncing against each other? The days are shorter. The darkness comes on us. But the light has come. It doesn't make the darkness all go away, but it beats it back, and it overcomes it. Sin and grace are the same way. Paul says sin increases, but where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. We understand that. The world is, is a tough place to be in. All the problems don't go away. Everything doesn't get fixed. Sin is still in this world. But it's been overcome by grace. It's been overcome by unconditional love shown to us through the Son, Jesus Christ. And death and life are the same way. Death ultimately gets defeated, but for now it's overcome so that it's lost its sting and it's lost its victory. We don't have to cower in fear of death because we know the one who brings life and gives life to us all. 
the good news of Christmas. Sally asked me the other night, she said, besides tearing the paper off your presents and frantically looking to see what was inside the boxes, what was your favorite thing about Christmas? And I said, nothing besides that. <laughs> that was Christmas to me, tearing off the wrapper and seeing what was inside. And, and I had one of those moms that we wanted to save not only the bows, but we wanted to save the wrapping paper. <laughs> so wait a minute, let's get a knife and just very gently slice it off and fold it back up. And, and I would be just, I would want to just wad it up and throw it away. I don't, and I, 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 right, I didn't know who gave me what. Save that card, save that card. We got to know who to thank for what. I just wanted to dig in. And when the shepherds came, it was kind of like, it's like they just kind of wanted to dig in. They, they intruded on this birth scene, and they just wanted to see. And when they pulled back the cloth, they found a child. They found a person, a baby, who would change the world. Emmanuel, God with us. Lupina said at the 5 o'clock service that one of the ideas of God being with us is that we are understood. And that was strong to me because I think the first realization I had of, of the living Jesus in my life was one of being understood. Not necessarily affirmed or approved because I was in college. But understood. It's great to feel that you're understood. Someone knows you at the deepest level and still loves you and accepts you. Emmanuel. So what do we do? We live it, we share it. We have to live what we profess, my friends. We can't just arrogantly announce it and try to arrogantly beat other people down with it because they're not one of us. That doesn't work. If we want our message to be spread, we have to not only believe it, but let it transform our lives and live our lives in such a way that people see the transformation that we profess and then share it with the world the same as the shepherds did. Our ministry center is this building that we purchased a couple of years ago now, maybe three years ago, and we rehabbed it. It was an electrical supply building and we felt uh, a sense to move back and to have some kind of presence back in our old neighborhood of, of Northern Hills. We were on Higgins Road before we moved out here. And we found this building that was just about a mile away, just right at Thousand Oaks and Earl Lane on Naco Pass, it's called. And we felt led to purchase that building for no other reason than to do ministry with and for the community. And that's what we've done. And it started in April. It started actually before April, but we opened it officially in April. Abdon Garza leads the ministry of the ministry center. And the purpose is to worship God, to pray, to serve the community in human services, and to partner with the community in ministry. It's very simple. It's not to build our church membership. You need to know Abdon. You need to know his heart and how, how he works. Wednesday night, I went to the Posada at the ministry center. It was packed, mostly with kids from the community, kids and families from the community, kids that Abdon and the, the other people who serve through the ministry center have met in visiting the apartment complexes there and getting to know the kids and, and interfacing with them and becoming really a part, an integral part of the community. I sat down by a guy who had a Tony Romo jersey on. He was a very quiet, Hispanic guy. And earlier that day, or earlier that week, Abdon had told us about this guy named Santiago. I can't go into all the story of Santiago, but one of the things I did hear that he told Abdon was that if someone is pointing a gun at your face, just stare at them right in the eye and don't show any fear. <laughs> I don't have to try that, Ed, to see how that would work. But that clued me that Santiago comes from a different kind of background than most of us come from. So I get to, I introduce myself to the guy, I say, I, I'm Pastor Milton, I'm one of the pastors at, at, at Northern Hills. He goes, my name is Santiago, you can call me Jimmy. I said, I think I'm just gonna call you Santiago. <laughs> and he begins to tell his story. And his story is, I came out of a really bad background, had a really hard life. I've been incarcerated, I've been homeless. And his wife is sitting there right by him, 
and nodding her head. And in fact, that's how I discovered the ministry center because at Haven for Hope, you could buy a bus ticket and you could ride it all the way out to this line because we have four buses that come together right in front of our building. And people would get on the bus at, from Haven for Hope, the homeless shelter, and ride as far as they could ride to see what they might find, what they might pick up. He said, I, I showed up here one day and I, I saw Pastor Abdon, didn't know him, but I saw him standing outside. And he said, would you like some food? And I went, sure. And we go in, I go, is this a church? Because most churches I've ever been in have discriminated against me, or I have felt discriminated against, is, is actually what he said. But Pastor Abdon just accepted me for who I was and fed me a meal and began to talk to me about the gospel. And I've been changed. I've been changed by this. And his wife is nodding her head. And he called, she had, he'd called and said, I'm at church. And she said, don't leave. Uh, don't, don't leave till I get there. I want to verify this for myself. <laughs> he said, my family doesn't believe me. I called them and let them know. They don't, they don't really believe that anything has, has actually really happened. But I've been changed. And I thought about my pledge to the ministry center. Is it a pledge for a building? I don't know. Is it a pledge that's going to help witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ? I do know that. It's a pledge to ministry, to lives being changed. And I heard it because this man shared it. And we got to get comfortable enough with their own story where we can talk about it. And we got to be able to talk about it because we're living it now. My life has been changed. Nobody believes me, but it has. I'm going to keep telling people it has, and they'll see that it has, and then they'll believe me. That's our message, a person who changes lives. It's very simple. We don't need to make it any more complicated than it needs to be. We don't need to muck it up with rules and religion and, and institutions and, and telling people you got to see it our way and believe it our way and do it our way or you can't get in. It's about a person, Jesus, who came into the world. And when you believe in him, you realize that really, really good news has come into your life. Let us pray. Dear God, in a world of bad news, we rejoice tonight in the good news of Jesus Christ. Part of me believes that it's hard to believe because I, I'm a sinner not worth dying for, but you did. You came into this world and you lived and died for me. You made yourself incarnate. You came in the flesh. You lived like we do. You felt what we feel. You understand us on the deepest level of our humanity. And you love us still. And you gave your life so that we could know the hope and promise of eternal life. I thank you for the way that your grace continues to change lives up until this very day. I thank you for the eternal change that has come in Santiago's life and in the lives of others like him who will be witnessed to and, and ministered to and brought to Christ. Help us to live as people who believe what we profess. Help us to live as people of integrity so that our witness may be one of authenticity and the skeptics of our world may see that there really is something to this good news that we claim and profess. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.